started. Um, I think most of you know me, but um, I'm Corinne Herlinghi. I'm the Director of Research Operations at CEPR, and um, I am introducing Jim Kemble, and I'm very happy to do it on behalf of Tom Kane, who unfortunately had a very important scheduling conflict, and he sends everyone his best, and he said, ask Jim really tough questions, so make sure you live up to that. Um, I think many of you uh, know that Jim is the Executive Director of the Research Alliance for University Schools because his face is beaming up at us, I feel like, everywhere I go on campus. Um, so if you didn't recognize him, I don't know how you, how you missed that. But I thought I would just share um, some things that maybe you don't know about Jim. Um, he, I got to work with Jim for seven years, at MD, seven of his 18 years, at MDRC, where he was the director of the K-12 policy area and a mentor to many. So if you haven't asked him about that work, I think then you could learn a lot about what it's like to work in that kind of organization and also um, all the opportunities there. Um, I was also really excited to see the Comparative Interrupted Time series in your what you're talking about today, which is near and dear to my heart, because Jim and I got to work on um, the talent development high schools evaluation, which employed that design, which I think at that time was sort of newish, or I don't know. It was new to me at the time. I had just come from the Kennedy School of Harvard. Um, the other thing you might not know about Jim is that he is an alum. Dick Renane was his advisor here for his... Um, ADD, uh, which is very important. And the other big thing, I think, is that he is truly from upstate New York, like Syracuse, <laughs> not New Paltz. Not, 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 not the Bronx and not Yonkers. Not the Bronx, not Westchester, <laughs> but seriously from Syracuse. <laughs> but really, um, Jim has done uh, amazing work at MDRC and at NYU and knows so much about rigorous studies and is a real teacher. And um, I don't think I realized you were initially a math teacher. So I knew you did some other work with you. but. Um, he's been an amazing teacher and mentor to me, and I know he has a lot to share today. A lot to share today, so I'm gonna let him get started. And I'm really happy that he's here. It's always great to be introduced by one of your favorite people. So thank you very much, Corinne. Um, so I'm going to talk about a study here, but I want to try to use it as a means to somewhat different or uh, multiple ends, uh, to talk a little bit about the kind of work that a place like the Research Alliance for New York City School does in the interest of trying to bring good education science uh, into the realm of decision making and practice in an education setting. Now this is a particular example of that kind of work, and I'll talk a little bit about, I, I hope, about why it's different than most, if, if much if not most of the other kinds of work we do. But the idea in general for this organization is that we are really trying to answer questions uh, that are important to people who make decisions about the use of public resources for the benefit of young people, in this case in New York City. So we really are interested in answering other people's questions. That's not to say that we don't raise our own questions, in, in, in the case of this, generate questions that we think are important to the public sector and to the business of providing good public education to young people. But the idea is that it ought to be relevant and it ought to be put in a position of informing, uh, not necessarily dictating, but informing the kinds of decisions that are going to be made about public education. Uh, so, so this particular study I'm going to talk about, a set of policies that were put in place in New York City uh, between about 2002 and 2013 uh, to try to improve the quality of high school education. Now, let me just start off here. H how many people have worked in the New York City public schools in one capacity or another? How many people in that era of the 2000s? Both of you guys are in the 2000s, there about you know, 2000 to 2013 or thereabouts. How, how many people are kind of familiar with the New York City education landscape in general? Like what was brought into place with the Bloomberg administration and the Joel Klein administration at the Department of Education? So you know a little bit about this. So I'll try to provide a little bit of context because I think that's pretty important for the kind of work I'm going to talk about here. Um, my preference in presentations like this is that you interrupt early and often with questions. Um, take me where you want to go. All right? Take me with the questions and the places that you're interested in hearing more about rather than let me prattle on. I, I will prattle on, by the way, so stop me from, uh, from doing that kind of damage to your ears if you, uh, you want to stop me. Everything, pretty much everything I'm going to have to say will be in about the first five to seven minutes of what I'm going to talk about, and then I'll kind of circle back and get to some of the places where the bodies are buried in data and analysis and methodological problems and, and all the, the, the challenges that come with trying to infer anything useful from all of this crazy analysis that I'm going to do. All right? So remember, early and often if you can. <laughs> 
you can do that. Uh, so let me start with a little bit of context, all right? So this is New York City uh, between about 2002 and 2013, which spans the mayoralty of Mayor Michael Bloomberg, a half, uh, uh, almost two-thirds of which uh, was under the leadership of Chancellor Joel Klein for the New York City Department of Education. Most of those policies were continued in the administration of uh, Dennis Walcott. Uh, a lot of the heavy lifting in the education reform landscape in New York City was focused on high schools. The high school reform movement really had three core uh, legs on a big stool, one of which was high stakes accountability. So there were a whole bunch of metrics and uh, measures put in place to try to identify higher and lower performing schools, including the equivalent of value added scores as well as performance levels, which I hope our new Secretary of Education eventually figures out what the difference is, uh, as well as measures of school context and uses of things like attendance in addition to test scores and, and graduation. But these this accountability system had some very high stakes attached to it, one of which was actually shutting down schools, high schools in this case, or any schools. I mean, this is not just specific to high schools, but actually shutting down high schools. And then a second leg in that was the creation of new, smaller schools uh, that were designed to replace the bigger high schools, usually in the same building. So instead of having one large comprehensive high school of five or 6,000 students, you would open up a high school of four or, 500, four or five high schools of four or 500 students each, each of which was an independent operating entity. And then the third leg in the stool was a universal choice system, which allowed students access to pretty much any high school throughout the city, and a tiered set of different kinds of admission standards ranging from highly selective to moderately selective to limited screening for students based on their neighborhood locations and their ability to you know, express an interest in the schools and completely non-selective high schools and an algorithm that eventually won a, uh, a Nobel Prize to make sure the students were matched. There was somewhat of an optimal match between students' preferences and the school's admissions criteria. So those are the three big pieces of this, and I'm going to focus on the first. I'm going to talk about this closure process and whether that, uh, what, what, what transpired for the students who were kind of caught in the web of this closure process. Um, the closure process, as you can well imagine, if you are part of any uh, politically uh, charged environment like New York City, uh, was, was really quite contentious. Um, there were newspaper accounts, television programs, all sort of documenting the huge outcry from community members especially who were really upset about the prospect of having one of these major community institutions uh, shut down. Many of the people who were protesting were parents of students in the schools. Those parents and sometimes grandparents had gone to the same high schools. Uh, these were the big community institutions that were sort of being swept away uh, in, the, in, the, in the wake of identification of you know, persistent failure in the way of very few students graduating from high school, very few students going on to post-secondary opportunities. Uh, during this period, New York City closed 29 uh, large comprehensive high schools affecting almost 50,000 students, the, the size of most middle-sized school districts, let alone uh, high school districts across the country. Um, uh, one thing you should note, uh, for anybody who knows anything about closing schools, these were done as what's called a phase-out. In other words, rather than have students uh, you know, show up for the last day of class on June 15th in one school year, and then be forced to attend a, sep a different school on September 1st, the following school year. In this case here, they allowed students to stay in the high schools. If they were ninth graders, they were allowed to stay for at least another three years before they were uh, having to switch if they hadn't yet graduated. Uh, they, but they stopped admitting new ninth graders. So the phase out was stop admitting new students, allow the students that are already enrolled to finish out the balance of their high school career for up to three years. Uh, most other, uh, and these were performance-based closures, so one thing that differentiates this among the very, very few studies that have been done on closures is that, uh, first of all, they were done as phase-outs rather than abrupt closures, um, and secondly, these are all performance-based closures. Many closures that took place in places like Chicago and Ohio uh, in Pittsburgh were all done largely, though not exclusively, as uh, uh, limited capacity and the idea of creating more efficient school systems with uh, absorbing uh, of that space for other purposes and then consolidating schools rather than because they were uh, uh, targeted for low performance. Um, Jim, was it, 
Yeah. Do you say the phase out was a concession to the political pushback? To the I, I don't think or? that there were very few things that the Klein administration did for as a concession. A concession. <laughs> I think what they really did was say, look, this is kind of a smart way to do it. This is, and, and in addition to which they were phasing in new schools too. So just the utilization of the building probably dictated that they wanted to keep students and keep the buildings utilized rather than let them go. In addition to supporting kids as they were trying to finish out their career. Yeah, John. That was my question. Was, was our, were pretty much all the schools being kind of followed up immediately by the sort of smaller schools coming in and using the Almost every building that had a, sh a shut down large comprehensive high school was repurposed for this collection of small schools of choice. Um, and one other thing I should say about this, this small schools movement, uh, NDRC, led largely by Corinne Herlihy, has done really a spectacular evaluation, I think, of using this, this assignment process in this choice thing which has a built-in lottery to identify real experiments and has de really been a great source of uh, systemic impacts, of positive impacts. All right, now I'm not getting this thing to move forward. So I don't know what that is. Let's try that. Yes, so let me talk a little about data and methods, and then I'm going to talk about findings, and then I'm done until I circle back again. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking really about three big overarching questions. There's a question about before the closure process, were these things really the lowest performing schools or did they, there's a big criticism of the process that they were kind of picking places that nobody liked, they were trying to get rid of teachers, they were not picking them based on performance, or if they were, it was kind of a unidimensional, which in some cases it was. So I want to talk a little bit about the characteristics and prior performance of the schools that were targeted for closure. The second thing is, is during the closure process, during this phase out period, so what happens to the students who are in the buildings at the time of the closure decision? Do they stay in the schools? If they stay in the schools, are they doing better than their past cohorts or better than students in other low-performing schools? If they left the schools, were they better off for not having attended the school that was closing and going off to someplace else? So I want to know what the impact of the, the closure process is on the students who are in there as it's going through. So there's about 10,000 students that I'm going to follow as first-time ninth graders across these 29 schools to see what happened to the students as the, as the schools were shutting down. And then there's a the question of after the closure process, what happens to the students who were most likely to have attended those schools had they remained open? And as anybody can quickly imagine, so how would you possibly find out who the kids are who would have gone to the school had it remained open since they no longer had the opportunity to even pick that place? So the methodological challenges of trying to figure that out, but we're going to try to identify another 10,000 students who at least demographically and based on their prior performance in middle school um, look as much like the kids who had been in the closed schools beforehand but now had to go someplace else because the option of the closed school was no longer there. So that gives you a sense of what the three big questions are and the kind of data we're looking at. Uh, we have administrative records from the New York City Department of Education ranging from uh, pre-K all the way through post-secondary. We're going to look at the 7th and 8th grade data as background characteristics as well as demographics. We're going to look at their high school careers including their transcripts, the credit accumulation, their grades, their attendance rates, uh, their progress toward graduation and whether they actually graduate and earn what in New York State is called a Regents Diploma which is an ac academic test-based uh, diploma that's now required actually by the New York State Board of Regents. So at any rate, the methods are going to be, as Corinne said, this thing called a comparative interrupted time series design, which while I would love to think that Corinne and I were on the cutting edge of the use of that methodology, it's a, basically a form of difference of difference, right? You're looking at historical trends for a group of places that are going to get treated and then looking after the treatment comes into place to see if there's a disruption in those trends, assuming that it's linear or something that you could actually specify as a model, does a deviation deviate from that trend? And then you're going to pick off some, co some comparison schools that look just like or as close to as like the schools that you're looking at as the treatment to see whether or not uh, there's a deviation from the trends for those schools that is coincident with the intervention that's being implemented, in this case, a school closure. And what that's supposed to do is pick up other things that are going on in the environment, right? In New York City, there's lots of things going on at the time of these closures. We want to see whether that's, those things are affecting other low-performing schools coincident with the closure process in ways that we should sort of say, well, let's take that out of the... Uh, 
out of the mix here. Uh, the counterfactual, hopefully there's enough peer students in here who now know what counterfactuals are. When I was in graduate school, we didn't talk about counterfactuals. I don't even know that they ever existed. I think these have been invented since 1990. But um, no, that's obviously not true. But at any rate, so we're going to talk about counterfactuals here as the students who were enrolled in these schools prior to the closure decision, um, as well as students who were enrolled in other low-performing schools that, in effect, dodged the bullet from a closure decision. And these were ones that would have been probably on the chopping block when you look at the characteristics of those schools, but they avoided closure for some qualitative, maybe political, maybe even some performance-based things. We're not exactly sure about what the determinants were for some schools who look just like a closed school not being closed and other ones closed. <coughs> so here's the answers to the questions. Um, so uh, the first question is, were these really the lowest performing schools? Yes. Uh, they fell into the, consistently into the bottom 5 to, percent, five to 10 percent. Uh, at the time of the uh, start of this, there were about 250 New York City public high schools. Uh, these schools that were subsequently closed consistently fell. We had a 10 uh, a, a 10 uh, characteristic or 10 performance based criteria. We created an index out of that. I'll show you what that looks like. These things fell into the bottom of the distribution for the overall index as well as for the individual pieces. Did, did, did the DOE use the same index for choosing uh, them or do you know? So the, 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 the criteria and the, the school performance indicators that the DOE used to identify closing schools really evolved over time. What we were going to do is just say, well, let's just use whatever the DOE did, and that's what we're going to get. It turns out neither the DOE could specify exactly what they used at any one given point in time, and it was changing over time. Eventually, what they ended up with was sort of a multi-component, if not index. They were looking at things like graduation rates, dropout rates, transfer rates, attendance rates, regents exam uh, accumulation, credit accumulation, and attendance. So we just used that from the outset for all of the schools and then applied it consistently over this, uh, this eight-year period. And we're looking at schools only that closed between 2002 and 2008, by the way, even though the, the follow-up period extends, extends beyond it. OK, so the first question is, yeah, these are, these are pretty low-performing schools. And they really do fall into the bottom pretty consistently. But they're not the only ones. Second question is, so what's the impact for the kids who are going through the school, who are in school at the time of the closure decision? Well, we found no net impact, positive or negative, on average, for the kids who were in the schools at, uh, throughout the closure process. And this, this really came as a huge surprise to me, at least, because most of the rhetoric and I think most of what people were thinking was, these are the kids who were right in the line of fire. They were being deprived of their primary educational opportunity. There's all kinds of disruption. It turns out that this was sort of a null effect almost across the board. There's some nuance to that that I'll talk about. Yeah? It's kind of a dumb question, but... No such thing. You know Did that. the schools actually close? Did they close? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they closed them. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right. It took three years, but yeah, they, they, they no longer existed. After, okay. In fact, after the decision got made, for the kids in eighth grade, they were not available. So they closed all of them, right? Yes, they closed oh, okay. 29 of them. There's another 15 that were closed, that they started closing in 2010, and their last year of existence was 2014. Okay. Go ahead. So John mentioned that the kids may have been in the exact same physical space as they, yeah. that they would have been under the closed schools. The, the other thing you also hear people talk about in the sort of school closure literature is that the teachers end up being the same too. That nominally it's, it was Washington High School and now it's like, you know, the school for the arts, but it's the same math teachers that were there before. Do you know anything about that? In this um, case? Mostly anecdotally. I mean, what, 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 what you're identifying, I'm not sure if I have it in the slides, but in the report, we have this litany of questions that are not answered by ours. One of which is, what is the effect on sort of the teaching core who are in these schools? Did they get reassigned? Did they end up in other schools that the same kids were going to? I, we don't, frankly, know empirically what that is. But the, when, you, when you talk to Joel Klein and some of the people on the administration, you find out that, in fact, one of the motivations for the closure process was to either redistribute or de-incentivize teachers, especially teachers who had not been, based on the performance of school, doing the job that they thought they should have been. So the idea was to really move teachers out or redistribute teachers elsewhere. And from what we can tell, there was a lot of turnover in the teaching core. If they ended up in the same schools that the kids went to subsequently, we can't quite tell. You know, we really don't know the answer to that. But it's a great question, and I think one that our data could allow for a lot of analysis. If uh, anybody is looking for dissertations, research <laughs> opportunities during the summer, we've got the data. Yeah? Uh, 
this may fall in the same category, but um, as the schools contracted, um, did the principals have more discretion than they might have normally had about who to, who to keep and who to dismiss? Yes, absolutely. Well, this, this was a hallmark of the reforms in general was the devolution of responsibility to the building level among the principals. In fact, there's an entire uh, piece of the reform effort that's around leadership training and of bringing in a whole new generation of teacher leaders part of whose responsibility was to figure out, make more, uh, have more uh, autonomy over hiring decisions, budget allocations, um, teacher assignments to subjects and that kind of stuff. So yeah, the, the, teacher, the principals had lots of discretion over which teachers stayed. Uh, I think there were still seniority things that allowed more senior teachers to stay, but the principal had to make some decisions around downsizing and could say, look, we're not, we don't have any more ninth grade math classes. Ninth grade math teachers are going to go. Anybody teaching algebra one or the equivalent is probably going to have to go. So there was a lot more discretion for that to happen as well. Yeah. Um, did you find? Did you? And this might be part of your more nuanced analysis later if I don't doubt. But were there differences in impacts between students who went to potentially higher performing schools, depending on where they moved? And then second, did you see any sort of longer term trends? Because I know some of the closed closure literature focuses on sort of like in the long run, you know after the initial negative impact, there might be some more observed effects. You guys are lining up all your dissertation questions right here. And the, the, it's, the table is set. Just walk right in and the <laughs> thing will get done. So no, we didn't do long-term follow-up. So we don't know like what were the, the five. And we were looking at four-year graduation rates, for example. We didn't do look at the five- and six-year graduations. That could start to wash out. And there's some reason to believe that that could have happened. We don't look at college enrollment rates, for example, to find out whether the, the higher graduation rates translated into better college-going rates, although the small school study that Corinne worked on does show pretty positive and strong effects, large effects, on college-going uh, for the small schools, many of which are received some of the students here. Now, not all of them. As you'll see, I'll show you some characteristics of the schools that they went to. We did not parse the analysis looking at what kinds of schools this group went to. I mean, we looked on average at what those schools looked like. We looked at some of the distribution of the schools that they went to, but we didn't say, okay, if you went to a school with a 80% graduation rate, were you better off than kids who went to a 20% graduation? Why do you think that would be? Why do, why do I think why wouldn't we go ahead and just say, oh, let's look at the kids who went to these great schools compared to the kids who went to the bad schools? Selection of like in terms of why Who's that teaching around here? Great job. I couldn't have answered that question 30 years ago. I didn't know what bias was. Great. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's, all, that's exactly right. We were really worried that, you know, if we were, all we were going to do was try to parse the data based on, a, uh, on an endogenous outcome like the reassignment to someplace else, and, and this could still be built into the data. Don't, don't get me wrong. Don't think we've got out all the selection bias that could be built into this. We weren't able to randomly assign the closure process. We also weren't able to randomly assign the kids to the schools that they went to when they couldn't pick the closed school. So I don't mean to say we've gotten it all out of there, but one of the reasons we wanted to look at average effects was so that we could rely a little bit more on uh, some minimization of the, the, the self-selection into higher versus lower performing schools. But on average, students who did, who came along in the post-closure cohort, did end up in better schools on average based on the character, the historical characteristics of those schools. So high, they went to schools with higher graduation rates on average. They went to schools with higher attendance rates on average, but not every kid went to a better school necessarily. Uh, uh, you know, some schools were better than others that the kids went to. But on average, we find that um, there was a substantial improvement in the uh, uh, graduation rates, particularly of the students who came along in the post-closure cohort. So the closures do appear to have a positive effect uh, on, on graduation rates and on some other outcomes, particularly early on in high school, for the young people who no longer had the opportunity to go to a, uh, uh, a closed school, a school that had been shut down. Now, the, the, the causal mechanisms that lie inside of that are a little bit more problematic to get after. Probably it does have to do with the fact that they went to better schools in some ways, even though they were not by any means. The, I mean, when you look at the performance levels of the students in this cohort, they're lower on average than the schools that they attended. It's just that they did better looking at this comparative or up to time series design than you would have predicted based on the sense of counterfactual we looked at. Yeah. So just on the, the, the middle one, the phase out, yeah. so the students could choose to stay in that high school that was going to close. So I'm a, I'm a first year student, 
I could stay and progress and graduate in theory in four years from that school, or I could choose to leave, right? Yep. So both types of students are in your sample. Yep. And are there you just did, were more people to stayers? Did they did they generally want to stay in their neighborhood school? Was that the can you just talk about the Yep. Yep, so good question. Another another selection bias question, right? Because if all we had done is just follow the kids who stayed in the schools, we know that that's a particular self-selected group of kids. Or if we just pick the kids who left, you got another problem. So we took both groups together, sort of averaging out some potentially positive and negative effects. We did disaggregate that one, just so we could kind of parse out, first of all, were there differences in, in attrition rates? Like, was there an impact on mobility? That's the first question. We also looked at, was there an impact on the characteristics of the students who moved? Again, relative to the history of mobility in those schools and relative to other low-performing schools during the same period. And we found, yes, A, there's an effect. Well, we found uh, yes and no. Yes, there's an effect on mobility. Uh, no, there's really no effect on the characteristics of the kids who move. So the mobility rates look like they're getting more kids of the same low-performing type to move to a different school, but they look a lot like the kids who had been attriting or moving prior to the closure decision and a lot like the kids who had been moving from the other low performing schools. Um, and so, but on average, when you look at the impacts on outcomes, um, there's really no, there's like zero effect on the kids who move. Okay, even though their outcomes are much lower than the kids who stay in the same schools. And, and I'm not gonna, I shouldn't have called that an impact. That's kind of like more of a, there's no difference for the kids who, uh, uh, who, who moved. But for the kids who stayed, there's some hints that, the, that there was an association with higher graduation rates, somewhat higher attendance rates, if you stayed in the same school. And when you control for background characteristics and prior achievement and do the best we can to get back to a more rigorous estimate of what the impact of staying in the school is likely to be, it could be positive. But we really don't claim any causal effect there. We kind of downplay that result, but we thought it was important both to look at the impact on mobility, the impact of the characteristics who move, and the impact on the outcomes or the, the differences in outcomes among the kids who stayed versus the kids who left. It's a long way to answer our so at any rate, so, so here's our three questions. So yes, these are really the lowest performing schools by and large. No, there's no effect really net positive or, po or negative for the kids who's, who are in the, in the midst of this phase out process. And it does look like the closure process got you some pretty positive, uh, pretty large by most evaluation standards uh, impacts on graduation. Methodological challenges not the standard. Okay. I got, I got this thing called an arrow on here now. So um, I'll start taking this apart. A any, other, any other sort of questions? Any other things where if I skipped around, I might be able to get to some of the things that you're interested in? All right. So let me start back through my three questions, OK? Were these the lowest performing schools? So the first way we tried to vet that was to like a, create this index. So this is a 10 outcome index. I'll not remember all of them, but I'll refer you to our technical stuff. But it's like Regents diploma rates, overall graduation rates, dropout rates, attendance rates, and these are cumulative uh, for the students coming through the high schools. Uh, credit accumulation, on track rates in the ninth grade, which we know from other work is a really strong predictor of graduation rates. Um, and we looked at the average of these outcomes over the four years prior to a closure decision. So we have the data to go back four years prior to each closure decision and rank order all the schools in the district during that period and then pick out where do the closing schools fall in that distribution. So this is, should be recognized as a kind of a, as a percentile distribution. So each of these squares represents a percentile of the, uh, of the schools in a given year uh, and the rank ordering, where <coughs> the diamonds are the actual closing schools themselves. So all of the closing schools lie on the bottom part of the distribution for this, this index, which we calibrated from um, as, a, as a ranking from 0 to 100. Um, and this one just happens to show the graduation rate, just one of, our, uh, one of the components of our, of, our, of our index here. So we're looking at the average graduation rate by the distribution of the schools on the overall index. All of the closing schools kind of fall back here. Every one of them falls below uh, 20%, the 20th percentile on the overall index. 
And each of these schools falls into the bottom 5% on at least two or more or three or more of the, of the components of the index. So they consistently fall way down at the bottom here. Uh, but noting that there are other squares in here suggest, shows you the fact that there's a bunch of schools that if they, if they were using a pure ranking system to pick off closing schools, at least using the one that we came up with here, these are schools that probably should have been closed as well. Okay, now why exactly they were is a little bit unknown, and even folks at the department as we interviewed them were really not able to say, well, you know, I think they tried to sort of take into account a new principle or some effort to try to reform the schools or some other turnaround strategy that was at play, although based on other work we did, it does look like even these closed schools were going through some sort of a extra effort to try to improve over time, uh, yet they were still closed down. But what this does do, I think, for us as the research team, or me as the research team, I should say, is it allows us to sort of start identifying some comparisons. So now that these schools have missed, have dodged the bullet of closure, let's follow them for over a longer period of time and let's see what happens to them. So they, they missed being closed. Let's let them go on about their business and see whether or not these schools turn out better for not having been closed relative to the schools that actually were shut down. So they become part of our counterfaction. Okay? Jim, for that first research question, was that important to the DOE or was that important to set up the rest of the analysis? Was that your question or was that theirs? So I think uh, that's, a, that's a good question for a couple reasons. So uh, the first thing I'll say is it's important to be careful about characterizing the DOE as a monolith. Uh, both temporally and for depending on who you talk to. So this study and most of the findings as they were coming out were coming out under the new, the post um, uh, uh, Klein and Bloomberg administration. All right, so it's a new administration who ran on, the Bayer de Blasio ran on a campaign, no more closures. We're just not closing any more schools. And, but not only that, we're not going to have any more of this ranking schools by the outcomes anymore. So the new chancellor comes in, and these, they, she's confronted with this crazy research alliance guy coming up and telling them about the closure process and says, well, wait, first of all, um, no, no, these, these kinds of outcomes really aren't important to us. Uh, we really are not going to rank any schools based on their graduation rates, and we're not going to hold them accountable based on just that. We're going to come in with a new set of criteria around school capacity and this framework we're going to build about how schools get organized and how people characterize the, the, the way that the school operates and the relationships among the individuals is the thing we're going to pay most attention to. So this whole thing that I'm presenting to you now, even though its idea came from the previous administration, this is the real disconnect between, or the potential disconnect between doing research to inform policy and practice when policy and practice is headed in a direction that becomes almost irrelevant to the work that we're trying to do here. So that's another piece of the punchline here about the risks of doing this. This, this Maybe this will get somebody a dissertation someday if they wanted to replicate it or a, a tenure thing, but at this point it's hard to say what's going to happen to it in the world of decision making in the New York City public schools or someplace else. But Marty West has agreed to sit on a three panel uh, in, a, in a few weeks. And we're going to have three other studies in addition to this one talking about the, the body of evidence around school closure, such as it is. And I think Marty will tell us whether or not this stuff really makes any difference. I'm sure he'll have a lot to say about the methodology, but I'd be interested in hearing more about the so what's. Like, okay, now we're starting to build up this quiver of arrows around understanding how these really controversial pri uh, uh, policies behave. Uh, what then should we do? Um, so here, here's more of this before closure question. Yeah. Um, can you go back one slide to the, to the uh, diamonds? Did those, the orange ones, include the ones that were closed later? Yeah, these are closed. So, so this temporarily, this covers like an eight-year period. It's actually a 12-year period because we're going four years before. So some of these schools, I can't remember which one, were closed in 2002, <coughs> some in 2008. Did you ever consider looking at a compared, like, using those, this, the later ones as counterfactual as the earlier ones? You know, well, I did, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a good question in part because I did that and I, I realized it was kind of a mistake to do that. Because what it started to do was confound the sort of the treatment with the treatment. Because now all of a sudden these, now, now, now that's not to say that some of these schools in here 
were closed after 2008. So they, they, they ended up in our counterfactual and then were subsequently identified for closure. But when I included these sort of almost by accident, I just sort of took me whatever schools were in there without accounting for the fact that during my treatment and follow-up period, these schools were going to end up both in the treatment and in the control group, in other words, right? So it got really complicated both to explain and then the effects were actually much bigger when I accidentally included those in there. It's like something's going on here. I can't quite figure out what's going on. And it was turning out that these, these counterfactual, when these schools were treated also as counterfactuals, I was starting to get results that, that just didn't make sense. And then all of a sudden I realized what was going on. So I kind of took them out just to make this a little bit cleaner if I could. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there and there. Oh. So I was wondering, so you said these were averaged over a period. Was there evidence that the closures were on like a downward trajectory over this period relative to the other schools? I'm going to get to that in just a second. Great question. Yeah. I love questions that are already answered in the slides that are coming up. Yeah. That's so great. I mean, you're asking a great question because I thought of that. <laughs> I was wondering in the comparison group, is there any possibility that there were any spillovers? Like, would, is it possible that students who would have gone to these schools that were being phased out, would they have gone to some of the comparison schools and maybe have impacted the population? Yeah, I think that's highly likely. I'm not quite sure we don't have good measures of the dynamics, but in fact, when you look at that post-closure cohort, that's exactly what happened, is that these students are being introduced into some of these schools here, uh, and then subsequently probably both affecting the population that was there and being affected by the population that was already there. It does turn out, though, that the kids coming out of the closed schools have outcomes that are much lower than the populations of students in the schools to which they're later assigned or later choose. Um, so I don't, and the, but the exchange and the sort of the dynamics of and the directions of effects kind of get washed out in all of the all the analysis that's being done. Where are these closed schools and comparison schools geographically? Like one thing I'm wondering is like, you know, given a certain neighborhood, maybe it's politically unviable to close two of the schools, so one's chosen. And or maybe some students who are at some closing schools kind of got double treated because both that school and another school nearby were closed, forcing them to sort of leave their neighborhood. Move even together. further away if, if possible. Well, that certainly possibly could have happened. Now, most of these closures, I would say of the 29 closures, and I have this someplace, uh, probably 20 of them were either in the Bronx or in Brooklyn. Now those are pretty big places and spatially, you know, there's not, you know, it's not necessary that you are walking to school within close enough proximity. I mean, those are places that are big enough where you have to take a public transportation or some other way to get there. Uh, and it's an open choice system. Now these are mostly neighborhood high schools in the sense that they're unscreened and they do draw most kids mostly from the communities. Um, but we didn't actually do our matching geographically. So we tried to take nearest neighbor type things based on the outcomes rather than the proximity. I guess that could have affected in some ways uh, the likelihood that kids from a closing school would have either transferred to or ended up opting for another uh, comparison school. But you'll see when I get to the matching thing, we tried to account for some of that by making sure our first line of mat after we got the best demographic and prior performance match, we tried to block it by some geographic things. So we were trying to take kids from the same communities or from the same likely theater patterns so that we ended up with kids who weren't, you know, we weren't going to take a kid from Staten Island and say, oh, you're a match for somebody in the South Bronx. That just wasn't good. There's no way that, those, that was ever crossing. And so, what was yeah, happening yeah. to the physical buildings over this period? Sorry if you already said this, but were no. they were the buildings like used for co-locations with charter schools, and to what extent did that play into the, the politics of COVID? Yeah, that, 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 good question. So, so um, all of these buildings were repurposed to become smaller schools. So the big, comprehensive 6,000 6, plus student high school became. Uh, like five schools of 500 or 600 each. So they, what they would do often is they would take the top floor for one school and the next and the next, or they would partition the building so that that school had that wing, that school had that wing. Uh, but the buildings were still utilized, although I think probably not at this, quite the same capacity. There was other uh, you know, movement into other spaces for these small schools. I mean, they created 250 new high schools over this period. Most of them were in existing school buildings, but others were in other kinds of facilities. The, high, the, the charter movement in New York City, there are now 200 charters in New York City. Um, very few of those are high schools. So not very many of the public high schools were repurposed for or made space for um, charter schools. 
Some did, but very, very few. That really was not a, a big part of the high school reform agenda. Certainly for middle schools, it was a big piece. In the K-8 to schools, it was. So was having these other small schools kind of operating side by side with the kind of schools that were being phased out, was that part of what folks were reacting to? Or was there you know, a sense that there was tension between those school communities? Or There are certainly uh, a lot of qualitative and anecdotal information about how hard it is to operate uh, more than one school in the same proximity, period. I mean, regardless of whether it's a closing school or two small schools. The whole idea of sharing, like, cafeteria space or the gym space or the band room and that kind of thing, or even just the idea of how do you create the right kind of laboratory environments for kids when the, when the space is being repurposed in different ways. Uh, but my sense is that was kind of a universal problem as New York City was redoing all of its school configurations. I don't think it necessarily was a unique aspect of the closure process because any of the, cre the, the new school creations were having to deal with how you allocate common space or shared space, even hallways, stairwells, things like that. I think, Corinne, you guys may have done a little bit of work just trying to figure out, like, so what did it mean to have, like, five schools operating in the same space where you had one big administration? Um, so here's some background characteristic stuff, information at students free and reduced price lunch, English language learning, uh, special education. Uh, you're not seeing a huge amount of differentiation among the schools, which was also a surprise. Everybody kind of thought that the closed schools were going to have you know, a much higher uh, percentage of uh, students uh, eligible for free or reduced price lunch or students requiring English language learning services or special education. This kind of came as a surprise to me and a lot of people that there wasn't bigger differences. And in fact, on some of these, you see that the, uh, that the uh, other schools had a higher percentage of, uh, for, for example, English language learners or, or students, or, or, or students uh, eligible for free and reduced price lunch. Um, here, here's some of other uh, uh, eighth grade characteristics, uh, and again, you, you see pretty similar uh, prior pre high school uh, uh, chronic absentee rate, which is uh, missing at least a month of school or more. Um, it, whether you had an English language arts or a math score in the bottom 20 percent for the district. Uh, and you, whether you were over age for the ninth grade, which is often a signal that you had been retained in a prior grade. Uh, the, 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 the closing schools had a little bit uh, uh, tougher to serve students than the other uh, low-performing schools. And then here's some outcomes based on the pre-closure cohorts. We looked at four cohorts of kids before the school, dis the closure decision was made. And again, you, you don't see a whole lot of difference. Who's the, qu the question was, so what, and I'll show you some trend information here. So this is not trends, these are averages. And the averages come out to be pretty close between both the um, closing schools and these other low-performing schools that weren't closed, but huge differences with the rest of the system. So this is the other, basically, 90% of schools in the district, and that's an average. So you can imagine that the distribution around this thing gets up pretty high when you, uh, when you look at some of the more selective schools in the district. Um, but it does suggest that overall you're looking at really the lowest-performing schools in the district pretty consistently on the ones that were closed. So, this comparative interrupted time series in design, and this will start to answer your question about what did this look like over time. So a comparative interrupted time series design, the first thing that it does is it looks at the pre-treatment trend. And we're going to look at graduation rates here. Okay? And so, uh, well, actually, the first thing you do is you look at the outcome level itself and the period after the treatment takes place. And that's the easiest, like a straight-up comparison would say, okay, so the school closed down. Here's the kids who are in the school. What was the graduation rate? This is the ninth graders, let's say, that were in the school at the time of the closure decision. 46% of them graduate from high school. Let's look at some other schools and compare them and say the difference between those two is an impact. Well, that's not necessarily a good indicator because this particular 45.7% um, is higher than what you would expect out of the trend that was going on prior to the closure decision. Okay, so here's a question. It's, it's pretty flat, but there is a little bit of a slope on here, and I can't remember if this particular one is statistically significant, but nonetheless, if you project that trend out in the post-closure period, you would have expected a 39% graduation rate. We got a 45% or 46% graduation rate, leaving this 5, 6.5% difference, okay? We do a statistical test, and we find out that, in fact, 
this difference here is statistically significant. So if you just did the comparison part, excuse me, if you just did the interrupted time series piece of the compared or interrupted time series, you'd say, oh, we're having a positive impact here. And it's a six percentage point impact on graduation rates if all you did was this, let's compare it to historical trends. And this is probably the most important part of the counterfactual, but it does not take account of the fact that there's other things going on in New York City. There's this choice process, there's other kinds of reforms, they're changing the leadership structure, um, they're really transforming the New York City public school system, and this trend here, may be, this difference here, some of this difference could be due to these other things. So let's look at other schools that weren't closed and do the same thing. Um, the first thing is the outcome levels are actually a little bit lower uh, after the closure period, and the trends are a little bit different, right? So this is one of the things here where the comparison schools look like they're on a little bit steeper trajectory over time. And when we showed this to the folks at the Department of Education, they were going, oh, that's right, that's why we didn't close these schools. <laughs> because they were starting to improve, so we didn't have to close them. Whereas they were, we could see they were getting a little bit better over time. Right? I'm just kidding, obviously. But at any rate, I mean, it, it is a kind of an interesting thing that this played out the way it did, is that, that these schools that weren't closed did turn out to be on a little bit different trajectory which meant that the change in their graduation rates, which is something that you would expect to have been coincident with the closure process in these other places, uh, turned out to be a little bit smaller. But this is probably the effect of other things going on in the district after the closure decisions were made at that particular point in time. And so we want to try to subtract this difference from the overall impact that we saw from the other time series to create this this difference in difference thing, okay? So here's a way to look at what I just showed you, the two graphs in all in one thing, right? So first thing we notice is I'm going to give you the projected graduation rate out here that I showed you, okay? But I'm going to kind of use this, I'm going to use a regression to both uh, control for the differences between these two sets of schools, and I'm going to center all those means on the, uh, on the treatment schools, on the closing schools, right? That's why these are both 32.9. Okay, so by regression, I'm sort of just controlling for all the differences, including the slopes, clo close, uh, the difference in the slopes, differences in the intercepts, differences in the characteristics, the pretreatment trends. But the difference in difference here still comes out to be the 6.5 versus the 1.4, which gives me a 5.1 percentage point impact on graduation rate. So that's how the CITS works, okay? The fact that this is not statistically significant means we're going to say there's too much probability that it's zero, so we're going to say that there's not a, a, a statistically significant impact on graduation rates, so we'll pay a little less attention to it. So here's our second impact question. What's the effect on the kids as they go through the uh, phase-out process? This column here gives us the impacts. Some positive effects on like overall graduation rates and regent diplomas rates, but they're not statistically significant. I'm going to be a little more skeptical about those. Yet you see the trends. The ch there's pretty big differences in graduation rates if you project the trends out and then look what happened to the kids afterwards. It's just that that's also going on in the comparison schools. You know, we saw this one here before for overall graduation rates. It's bigger for the regent's diploma rate. Uh, cumulative credits earned on track rates. Or excuse me, attendance <coughs> rates. All right. So at any rate, this this is what led us to the conclusion that we're going to say there's really no net effect. We're going to be pretty conservative. We're using a 0.05 p-value here. Some people like 0.1. I think this one would have been statistically significant at that. But given the weak design, given some of the skepticism about the methodology, we kind of left it at that. Corinne, let me see if I have your slide here. No, I don't. Shoot. Uh, there's another slide that looks like this in the report where we disaggregate the findings based on kids who moved out of the schools compared to the kids who stayed in the schools. This is Corinne's question about, well, if they stuck around, did they do better than the kids who had left? And um, what you see is two things. One, for the kids who stayed, these outcome levels are much higher than the kids who left. And these impact numbers are a little bit higher than for the ones that left. Okay, so there's a hint that if you believe this non-experimental, even more non-experimental comparison, that if there was an impact of the phase-out process, it would have accrued more to the kids who stayed in these 
uh, in these closing schools as they were being shut down than it did for the kids who left the schools and went elsewhere. I'm a little tenuous about that. Anybody have any hypotheses? You've gotten really good feedback on why that was. Any thoughts? Why would the kids who stayed in these things as they were being shut down turn out better? Or have somewhat have the hint of a stronger impact? Like that, I think it was probably 11.5 percentage points here, or maybe even a little higher. They didn't have the disruption of transferring schools. That, that, so that's a, that's a great point. So most of the other closure stuff, including work that folks here did in Newark. Did you work on the, who worked on the Newark? Yeah, you did the Newark thing. And, okay. So you guys, I think, found some positive effects for kids who went to better schools than you did for kids who, and this was an abrupt closure, right? The schools closed one year, and then you got to go someplace else. This happened in Chicago. It happened in Ohio. I think it happened in Philadelphia. And most of what you're picking up is the traditional finding that mobile students tend to have lower outcomes than non-mobile students, even after you control for all of background characteristics and other pre-existing performance. So you might be picking up in that mobility stuff uh, an effect of mobility, disruption that kids are sort of having to move around, switch regimes, get used to a different teachers, a different administration, a different set of rules. So that could be partly what's going on. So that, that's one strong hypothesis that people had about why there were a little bit stronger effects for the kids who stayed. And then the, the kind of converse is true. I think their schools were probably more stable because they weren't taking any, in any new people. So you weren't getting those kids who are like constant movers, right? There are kids that are mobile all the time, and they come into your algebra class, and the teacher has to catch them up, right? So the schools were smaller, but they're also probably more stable in that they weren't taking anyone new, yeah. and particularly kids who are more mobile who tend to be lower achieving. Yeah, right? and the DOE really thought that was probably what was going on, was that these were, in effect, becoming smaller, more personalized learning environments. You were getting teacher only the teachers who really wanted were committed to staying and felt like, I got to stick by the kids, so you may have had a more committed group of teachers sticking around and, and administrators. Uh, the, the, the sort of the personalization thing, the stability thing, the continuity. Uh, Bob Hughes at the New, at New Visions for Public Schools kind of hypothesized that you probably had some residual uh, of support for kids that, that would have come along, especially for the kids who stayed. So that, that, that could very well be. Yeah. Can you look at the New York City um, school climate surveys? Uh, we didn't for this. We didn't for this, partly because the New York City Climate Survey doesn't start until 2006-07, kind of right in the middle of this period. So we, A, we didn't have a time series, and B, we didn't have data on a lot of the schools, the comparison schools or the closed schools in, in, the, you know, in the early parts of the 2000s. So um, I think the MDRC folks are looking at that stuff on the small schools, and they're trying to figure out whether there are good uh, mediators of the effects that might have to do with whether the schools were more personalized or whether the teachers were more focused on the kids or whether there was stronger trust or a safer environment. And I don't, I mean, neither Corinne nor I can get those guys to release any results. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, so um, I, I'm kind of done. I can go more into the methodology here. I think we have five more <coughs> minutes. I mean, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road, right? We get positive effects for the kids who come along um, after the school closure. And, and, and this was the hardest. This took me, uh, it took me forever to try to figure out some methodology. For, like, how do you identify the effect of treating somebody in a way that isn't something? Right? What we're going to do is take something away from you and see what that does to you. So the counterfactual on this is completely flipped around. So what we tried to do, or what I tried to do here, was first of all, let's find some students who at least demographically, and based on their eighth grade attendance, test scores, uh, whether they were over age for grade, their, their special education and English language learning status, let's see if we, at least we can identify a group of kids who look just like them. And then start finding whether or not, see if we could find a way to see if they would most likely have gone to the closed school. So we tried to create this set of concentric circles to find a nearest neighbor match based on these background, this, this algorithm for a, a matching process. So the first thing we did was we tried to look for a student that, had go, that was going to end up, that was going to the high school, to, the, to a high school in the building of the closed school. That was the first place we looked. 
And so this is a caliper matching process. If anybody's familiar with these terms, we used like a 0.1 standard deviation caliper. So we tried to make it as small as we could. And we looked for somebody who fit within that band who was going to end up, who ended up going to the uh, a school within the building that was closing. Okay, that was the first piece of the concentric circle, really small. Geographically, we then went to schools and we couldn't find a kid in that group. And, and I think we found about 40% of the kids here. Then we went to the feeder middle school. So if we couldn't find you here, we went to the feeder middle school, the, the most predominant feeder middle schools for that building before it had closed to see if we could find somebody there. If we didn't find you there, we went to your zip code. If we didn't find you there, we went to the community school district. So these are kind of ever increasing things. If we couldn't find you there, we went to the borough. So we found this group of matched kids and we, we did a pretty good job. We got a couple of individual characteristics where there were statistically significant differences, but we did this overall F-test specification so there was no systematic differences across the characteristics. So we think we got a pretty good match, but I think anybody worth their salt at a decent doctoral program could start figuring out ways that there might be some selection bias built into this. Um, and I, you know, but, you know, it's kind of the best you can do. This is the kind of the nature of this kind of work. Um, and here, so here's what we found. 45% of the kids were enrolled in the building that housed the closed school. 53% were, were housed in the district uh, that housed that closed school previously. And 86% were in the same borough. Okay? So we, we did decently, I think. Um, here's the differences in the schools. So here's the characteristics of the closed schools. Here's the characteristics of the schools that, that were attended by the kids in the post-closure cohort. So this is the average school characteristics, but it's weighted by the number of students in our sample that ended up in one of these schools here, right? So on average, you'll see that most, of, other than the background characteristics, or for most of these background characteristics here, they're fairly similar. But when you get down to the outcomes, for example, the on-track rates in the closed schools are just dramatically lower than the on-track rate. This is an indicator from the ninth grade about whether you earned enough credits and took a Regents exam to be on track to graduate four years later. And it's, it turns out to be a really strong predictor of graduation. <laughs> Even attendance rates, credit accumulation, overall graduation rates, Regents diploma rates, these are on average much better schools that the kids are going to by virtue of being deprived of this option to the closed school. Um, now, the, the, it turns out that the students that we identified don't look very much like these outcomes. But the schools they're going to, too. So your question about peer effects kind of comes into play here in both directions. Here's the impacts, right? Impacts. So uh, there's a bunch of, there's another table that shows there's impacts at ninth and 10th grade outcomes. When we get to cumulative attendance, there's no overall statistically significant result on attendance or credit accumulation, but there is on graduation rates in this, and most of that is all because kids are now earning Regents diplomas rather than local diplomas, which doesn't have any testing requirements. And some back, sort of like, here we go. This, here's what Marty's going to talk about at three. I really recommend this, uh, this session here. It's probably one of the better ones at three. Um, uh, I think it's important to keep a lot of things in mind here. First of all, even though we identify this positive effect and kids are doing better, they're not doing very well. You basically get the graduation rate from somewhere around 45, 48% to 55%. Uh, you know, still very, very low, among the lowest in the city, but you know, it is a positive impact. Uh, you got to really <laughs> weigh here the, we've answered some questions, but I mean, you all can think of the, the teacher effects, the, the administrator effects, the community effects. You know, these unanswered questions, I think, are really important to get after here. Nobody's done it yet. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is the context. I mean, this is an era in the country and in New York City where the focus is on dropout factories. These are schools that can't get their graduation rates over something like 30 or 40 percent on average. Uh, and there's a lot of them. What happens when you start shutting those down? you got a whole different mix of kinds of schools. Is closure really the right policy, even if you find out that it does seem to benefit students, some students? Um, you've got a whole different uh, dynamic now when it's not about high school graduation, even it's about college access and success. Uh, is closure really the right kind of uh, policy there? And then finally, you know, with the current administration, they're interested in trying to build supports for school improvement. It's about building capacity of schools. It's about the sort of internal dynamics of schools rather than just the outcomes. And 
how do you identify failing schools uh, when you're lo looking at through the lens of their, their function? Um, and then this last slide is just about the research alliance or was. Oh, hey, this one works. <laughs> I'm going to stop there and see if there's any last questions or whatever. And I'm happy to stick around, and I think there's a post mortem on this somehow. There's a half an hour of reception with snacks, and they can talk to you too. Great. Yeah. I have a question on the movers. So you said that there was a substantial amount of students who moved to other schools. Yes. So did these go to certain schools, like to a small number of new schools, or was that spread out throughout? They the were really widely dispersed. Oh. I was really shocked that. So there was, uh, which I, uh, the report has a bunch more information about the mobility. There's a big effect on mobility. 10% more kids, there's an impact of about 10 percentage points on mobility. But those kids turn out to be pretty widely dispersed, mostly throughout the borough. Uh, uh, of the of the uh, the ho that house the the small schools, um, and they go to a pretty eclectic set of schools as well. I mean, some of these are pretty low, and although most of them turn out to be pretty low performing, uh, but again, that doesn't appear to have affected them very much in terms of they were no better or worse off than they would have been had they moved from the school before it closed, or they were no better or worse off than their kid than the kids from other low performing schools that messed, even though there were more of them. Yeah. To follow up on that, is there any data on how this? students who moved affected those schools? Not in our study. It's a great question. I think this whole idea of peer effects in general is really critical because a lot of people were hypothesizing that this whole disruption to the system was creating a dynamic in which receiving schools were all of a sudden dealing with a lot of students with learning needs, English language learning needs, with low prior performance, with bad attendance and that kind of stuff, and it was really potentially creating lots of problems for the way that the schools were operating. Uh, you know, although other people were saying, well, at least these students are now in a, in a different and better potentially learning environment, so it's for the students who were moving or for the students who were displaced, there should be some positive effects. But I, I think that's a great question, and we haven't gotten after it. I think uh, there's not been enough work to try to figure out what the what the peer kind of effects in general are for this kind of stuff, because that's one of its biggest effects, one of its biggest impacts. There are no more questions. I'd like to thank you all for coming.